I think people have to really dig deep into what is that takes them into that parasympathetic yeah. state. Because most of the time we think the stress is something, but in my experience, is their perception of what they're doing that is way more important than what they're doing as per itself. Hi, my name is Rongan Chasji, GP, television presenter, and author of the best-selling books, The Stress Solution and The Four Pillar Plan. I believe that all of us have the ability to feel better than we currently do, but getting healthy has become far too complicated. With this podcast, I aim to simplify it. I'm going to be having conversations with some of the most interesting and exciting people, both within as well as outside the health space, to hopefully inspire you, as well as empower you with simple tips that you can put into practice immediately to transform the way that you feel. I believe that when we are healthier, we are happier, because when we feel better, we live more. Hello and welcome to episode 59 of my Feel Better, Live More podcast. My name is Rongan Chatterjee and I am your host. Today's guest is a good friend of mine, Alessandro Ferretti. Alessandro is a nutritionist, a published researcher, an international lecturer and a clinician with over 15 years of experience. We actually recorded this conversation back in December 2018, so I'm delighted to finally be able to share it. On today's show, we cover a wide variety of different topics, but one of the key messages is a reminder about how unique we all are, how different stresses in life can affect different people in different ways, how the same life situation can serve as a stressor to one individual, but be entirely relaxing to another. A lot of the time, this comes down to our own individual perception of the situation. We also talk about something called HRV or heart rate variability. Now, if you have read my most recent book, The Stress Solution, you will already have a good understanding of what HRV is and why it is such a powerful measure of our health. HRV is a fantastic way to measure the total stress burden on your own body, whether it be from too much work, overload, eating the wrong foods, eating healthy foods but at the wrong time, caffeine, sleep, and so much more. Alessandro has a wealth of clinical experience and he has meticulously tracked his own HRV and blood sugar levels as well as those of his clients. This personalized feedback has given Alessandro a lot of expertise in this area, which he shares with us all in our conversation today. I found Alessandro's insights fascinating and I'm sure that you will do too. Now, before we get started, I do need to give a very quick shout out to our sponsors, who are essential in order for me to be able to put out weekly podcast episodes like this one. Athletic Greens are a long-term supporter of my podcast. Now, whilst I prefer that people get all of their nutrition from food, I do recognize that for some of us, this is not always possible. Athletic Greens is one of the most nutrient-dense whole food supplements that I have come across and contains vitamins, minerals, prebiotics, and digestive enzymes. So if you are looking to take something each morning as an insurance policy to make sure that you are meeting your own nutritional needs, I can highly recommend it. For listeners of this podcast, if you go to athleticgreens.com forward slash live more, you will be able to access a special offer where you get a free travel pack box containing 20 servings of Athletic Greens, which is worth around £70 with your first order. You can check it out at athleticgreens.com forward slash live more. Now... On to today's conversation. So, Alessandro, welcome to the Feel Better Live More podcast. It's a great honor to be here with you, Rangan. Uh, as, as being one of the podcasts that I thought absolutely fantastic. Oh, brilliant. Well, look, thanks for the feedback. And I think people are really going to enjoy today because you are an expert in nutrition. Um, there's no question about that. But. <laughs> What we end up talking a lot about is stress, and in particular, something called heart rate variability. So I want to really delve deep into that today, but I wonder if you could start off by talking about stress. You know, what is stress? And then move on to what is heart rate variability? Um, sure. Um, I think you are far too complimentary to me. Uh, I'm, I, I love researching and I love things that I do, but um, yeah, I, I, I never like to call myself an expert on anything. <laughs> I'm too young for that. But anyhow... Um, to me, it was very imp- 
important part of my research to look at the effect of stress because I started to, um, uh, let's say, being familiar with heart variability through sport. But then soon realized that the, the, the effect that our environment has on our body um, and affecting heart variability can be from all sorts of sources. And interestingly, my uh, also definition of stress, what I consider stress, uh, has also changed because we normally associate stress with work or familial um, problems. But in actual fact, anything that is a load that would lead the body to fail within their immediate environment can be considered a load. So in this sense, and obviously uh, I need to be careful about my personal bias because being a nutritionist, of course, is everything about the diet. Yeah, sure. As, as, as a, a personal trainer, we think that is all, everything is linked to the type of exercise, for example. So I soon found out that uh, stress is probably one of the things that affect our physiology the most. Um, I prefer to call it life load or loads because normally stress has a negative connotations um, attached to it. Whereas I found out that, for example, I love what I'm doing when I go on tour, in, on roadshow, lecturing, uh, is all stuff that I really enjoy doing. And yet the impact of my physiology is very, very tangible and measurable. Yeah, and, and I think this is this is super interesting for people because I think, Alessandro, what you've managed to do is through your own research, uh, through tracking heart rate variability and other metrics on your on your clients, you have really started to build up a picture of what lifestyle factors do what to our body. And what's interesting when we've spoken in the past about this is that it's different things for different people. So I'm guessing there are some commonalities, yeah. but there's also some maybe sort of individual differences. Absolutely. And that's the reason why I virtually stopped in, uh, in telling people what they should be doing to relax. And to a certain extent, I'm very, very careful with food and diet because I first handled measured that, for example, a, a, a blood glucose curve following a certain meal, following exactly the same meal, eaten exactly at the same time, wife and husband had two completely different profile or profiles in this case. And when you say profile, what do you mean? Are we talking about this heart rate variability? Uh, I done it with both, uh, Rongen. I done both with um, uh, glucose following a meal and also heart rate variability. In this case, I was going, um, I used an ongoing uh, measuring uh, type of device. And it, it, what was really interesting was exactly what you just mentioned, the individual uh, variations that given the same load, stressor, food, um, had very, very different impact on uh, the individual. Yeah. So that, that was quite enlightening for me because obviously most of the time you think this is good and this is bad. And I think we go slightly, okay, there are things that are extremes. I understand that. But we, uh, we need to be really careful in advising things to do because people may respond very differently. Yeah. I mean, Alessandro, we, we spoke a lot this summer. Um, you were helping me with the heart rate variability section in my book, The Stress Solution, which is brilliant. <laughs> um, and I really appreciated your feedback from all the work that you had done with your clients. Um, I think it's worth at this point, some people will be listening to this and wondering what is heart rate variability and why should it matter to them? Right. So heart rate variability is a reflection of the parasympathetic and sympathetic tone of our nervous system. So our nervous system is divided in a very gross kind of description, of course. Um, when we are active, when we are uh, engaged, and that would be more of the sympathetic activation. And then the more recovery associated, relaxing, resting uh, part. So for example, when we work all day, we are more likely to be in a sympathetic activated state. 
Um, and when we sleep, we should be in a more parasympathetic state. So this will be a balance between um, us doing things and being uh, in contact with the environment and people and being active, uh, or exercise, for example, that is reflected uh, in heart variability too, and also the more recovery. Then these two should be in a form of balance, in a sort of balance. And I think a useful way that I think about it uh, to describe to the public and uh, and to my patients is I think about a stress state and a thrive state. It's not necessarily quite the same thing, but yeah. it's to really get the idea that we. We've got a sympathetic nervous system, which is there to help us. And, you know, we need it for various things. You know, we're engaged in things we we get anxious and agitated by something. We need to run, you know, we, we, our sympathetic nervous system gets activated, but we also need the, the opposite, the, what I call thrive state when we're, when we are relaxed and we're chilling out. Yep. Um, it's, you're saying that these things need to be in balance, but I think you're also saying that heart rate variability is a really nice way of measuring the difference between the two and what state we're in. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. So when the the technically the the heart variability is basically the variation that there is between heartbeats. So we think that if someone has a I don't know sixty beats per minute heart rate, we think that every second you know to the count the heart would beat. Well, a a, a more relaxed healthy body would have a variation in that. So for example, one beat is at one stage, and then instead of being one beat every other second, perhaps is 0.9 of a second, 1.1 of a second, and it keeps changing. So, so we want that variability, don't we? That's absolutely. a good thing. And I think people absolutely. get confused by that because they, they do think that the heart should beat like a metronome, beat to beat. Um, but it it's interesting, isn't it, that when there is... That variability, I guess it reflects that we are able to adapt to a changing environment around us. So Precisely. So we're looking for more heart rate variability. That's a good thing, generally speaking? Generally speaking, that's correct. Um, we have instances where in, in, in high-end elite athlete, when that may not be always associated with a great thing, but we are talking at a very, com- you know, very completely different group. So, so for most of us Correct. who are not elite athletes, yep. who you know, are interested in how different things affect our stress response system, what are the things that you found? I mean, I'm guessing there is, you know, there's obviously going to be variation between individuals, but you know, everyone's focus these days on, you know, trying to eat a better diet. Yeah. trying to move more. You know, I've said it multiple times, I think we we neglect things like sleep, we neglect stress in a big way. And you have seen in your work, haven't you, that stress, for example, um, or what, you, what your body perceives as being stressful can have a remarkable effect on multiple things, including your blood sugar level. That, that in a nutshell is the, the summary of what I've been um, trying to research for the last few years. Um, that, that, that is absolutely correct. Going from an example of someone, then I looked, I looked at, at um, and the person's um, ongoing reading for heart variability and see that it was pretty stressy. And then every two to three days, I actually saw a, a very nice mid-afternoon parasympathetic state. And I thought, what the heck is that? And so I challenge, obviously you need to be careful because you know that he's in a parasympathetic state, but you don't know what has led the person. And then and, and in the past, I advised the person to take relaxation techniques and maybe look at a certain relaxation books and, and, and it was just getting more and more wound up. And I thought, okay, well, so I'll tell you what, what is it that happened in that time in the afternoon? I asked the patient and then um, he said, um, I'm a bit hesitant to say. I said, "Oh, no, nothing private. Obviously, it's fine." <laughs> but and I, I thought, "Okay." He said, "I'm washing my car," and I went, "Right. I think you're going to have a very clean car because what I'm going to suggest is you need to mimic or wash the car. Do something that takes you back into that recovery parasympathetic state." So basically, you you were tracking his heart rate variability. Correct. And you found that at some point in the afternoon, remarkably, his heart rate variability was quite high, which indicates that our body's in a state of relaxation. Flow. Flow, yeah. Or Perhaps. what I was calling thrive state. Yeah. So 
This is amazing because it allows you to individualize, personalize care for that person. Say, hey, what were you doing at three o'clock? Oh, you're washing your car. Well, when you're washing your car, you were in a very chilled out state. Yep, absolutely. Happens to be in, 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 in my personal life. So for example, if I, if I want to meditate in a very specific um, manner or with a specific structure, it's really hard to actually see me entering this parasympathetic state. Whereas if I practice my karate forms at very low speed in a kind of Tai Chi manner with no power and I'm right in the woods outside my house, I can see a huge parasympathetic activation, despite as a martial art. And, and, and this could be said for all sorts of things. So I think people have to um, really dig deep into what is that takes them into that parasympathetic yeah. state. Because most of the time we think the stress is something, but precisely as you mentioned in my experience, is their perception of what they're doing that is way more important than what they're doing as per itself. Yeah, so it's very hard, I guess, to say this activity is stressful or this activity is unstressful because it depends on the individual. So, you know, one man's poison is another man's medicine to, yeah, a, to a certain degree. <laughs> so that's interesting. So one of your clients washes cars and his body just loves it and he's chilled. Um, what have you... What else have you found? Are there some other surprising things that you have found when observing this with clients? Things that potentially we might think are, are conventionally stressful, yet that has not been reflected in their heart rate variability reading. Um, mama, um, quite a few, I guess. I think uh, uh, I might mention some of the the ones that perhaps I wasn't expecting. So we all expect that work is stressful. And yet I see sometimes people when they are, what we say, in the flow, you can see this massive parasympathetic rebound. Um, so parasympathetic rebound, you're saying high heart rate variability. High heart rate variability. Which, which indicates the body's in a relaxed state. It, yes. One thing that um, I think has been really, really revealing for me is routine. If your body would know that every day, at a certain time, certain things are happening. If mentally there are cues to tell the body that that is the starting of the relaxation, it doesn't seem to matter if he's cal you know, candle with in a hot bath or watching your favorite program or playing a board uh, game. It doesn't seem to matter. The body will seem to enter. So basically what I'm trying to say is the people that had more scattered type of lifestyle are the one with the lowest heart rate variability. And which indicates more stress on the body. That is correct. Yeah, which, which really, I think we all, well, certainly I know that I respond better when I'm in a routine. Uh -huh. um, when, when I go to bed at the same time and wake yep. up at the same time, yep. I just, I'm, I'm like a different person. I. I find it easier to eat better. I've got more energy. I, I can feel that I'm less stressed. Um, and you, the, the longer you stay in that routine, the more locked in you get. You sleep deeply. You wake up at roughly the same time without an alarm, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's incredibly challenging, of course, for people with shift work to do that. So they're constantly changing some of them from day shifts to night shifts. Um, have you got any clients who've done shift work that you've seen any of this data on? Yeah, it's... Um, what happens? So in some of your clients who are shift workers, what happens? Do you see this really low heart rate variability a lot, which reflects a very stressed out body? That is in a nutshell what I tend to see. Um, now, an interesting point, the people, they seem to have... So if we take the sum of all the things that impact on our health, people, generally speaking, have a little give on certain things. So instead of having to follow an absolutely perfect diet, as long as they reach a certain degree of health, same thing with exercise, same thing with stress or life load, same thing with uh, anything else. So they, as long as there is a certain uh, baseline, then they are okay. People, that, the, 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 the few people I have seen 
but taking experience from colleagues then that they work on shifts, that leeway is very, very reduced. They have to have a great diet. They have to have good diligence in every other areas in order to account for the shift yeah. work. I mean, Alessandro, I think that's a really important point. So, um, you know, I talk about this four pillar framework a lot because yeah. I think, you know, when we look at food movement, sleep and relaxation, and if we maybe don't strive for perfection in one area, but we're doing enough in each area. So, you know, this is the opposite really of someone having the perfect diet. And I have got patients who frankly do have what appears to be quite a perfect or optimal diet. Yep. Yet at the same time, they're only sleeping five and a half hours sleep a night and they're working hard, really, really hard into the evenings and they're really stressed out. And I say, hey, you know what? You might be better off just chilling out a little bit on your diet, but going to bed one hour earlier and having a bit of a wind down in the evening. And, and it, it's interesting. So what you're saying is with shift workers, if, you know, because many people even listening to this podcast will work shifts and think, well, I have to do that. I know I've got lots of nurses who listen to this podcast. Yeah. They're like, well, I have to go on night shifts. So I think the empowering thing here from what I'm hearing is that, okay, that is a stressor on your body. That's yeah. an insult. So that means you've got to sort of make sure the other areas of your life are optimized as much as possible. So you can almost mitigate it as much as you can. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, anything else that you can do to support your body, I think is, it, is brilliant. Um, the problems start to happen when you don't do that or you can't do that. And on top of that, you have the shift work impact on yeah. your physiology. And the, what I find a little bit um, upsetting is these are the very people they offer are looking after other people in the medical profession or with high responsibility jobs. Security, uh, police. Security, absolutely. absolutely, workers. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I only know really a handful of people that can maintain health, that have maintained health, but they are so diligent in their lifestyle, they can't afford to have a poor lifestyle. They can't afford to not go to the gym or not have physical activity. It doesn't matter just the gym. They have to be as They've diligent as they possibly can because sleep and chronobiology is already out. Yeah, because you're right. These are the people in society who, you know, a lot of them look after us and yep. keep us safe. And, yep. you know, a manning us when someone has a heart attack at two in the morning, you know, there are people there to help them. And it would be nice if we could, could find a way to support them better. I've interviewed a um, couple of sleep experts, a chronobiologist, and really, really enjoy that. And it seems to me that there are slightly different theories um, as far as I understand it, and I'm not a chronobiologist or a sleep expert, um, if someone can get into a shift night routine, that seems to uh, be not as detrimental as constantly changing the shift time. Yeah. Let's move on to time to diabetes because... Type 2 diabetes is commonly called a blood sugar problem. And clearly, you know, the way we diagnose type 2 diabetes is when your blood sugar can no longer be maintained in a physiological range, it starts to go higher. And once you it reaches a certain point, we diagnose you with type 2 diabetes. And of course, I know you're a nutritionist. I know yep. that much of the debate around type 2 diabetes focuses on sugar and carbs. And of course, whilst Sugar and in particular refined and processed carbs are a real problem for many people with type 2 diabetes. I'm very passionate that it is not a dietary problem. It's an environmental problem, diet being one component. And you've done some interesting research, haven't you, on stress and how that impacts blood sugar? Yeah, um, I, I decided to do basically a preliminary run for a proper trial. Um, and <sighs> This has been happening for 
a while now in the field of nutrition. They, they, there are trends, are there? So there was the Mediterranean diet, there was the ketogenic diet, the low-carb diet, the low-fat diet. So we, we, we have seen them all. And one of the things that I love doing is trying to research these, not necessarily bias in advising them, but is to actually research. So I started to see that people with a tendency to type 2 diabetes on a low-carb diet seems to do very well. And it's still probably now one of the things that I might consider when someone with sure. type 2 diabetes. Um, however, I seem to have obtained very, very similar results to not just reducing the carbohydrate and be on a low carb, high fat diet with good level match level of protein, but also when people started to restrict the eating window, for example. So when they eat? When they eat uh, and also how long they eat for in the space of a day. So how many roughly hours that, that, that they are eating for during the day. So when is from the first meal to the last meal, so the first time they introduce food to the, to the last time, I also noticed that people on a slight restricted um, uh, energetic intake also seem to have a very similar benefit. So we need to start to ask a few questions here because obviously there is the same result with three slightly different approaches. And many times you see people on a low carbohydrate diet, they're also what they do, they do other things that would actually help their health so they're starting to eating in they're starting eating uh in a in a narrower window of time they also take other things so there could be some confounders attached to that so i decided to take health individuals and see what impact because it's much harder to see big changes in if you're already healthy if you're already healthy and strangely enough glucose was very, very poorly correlated with the amount of carbs intake, not only the day before, but for the four to six weeks period that I have tested. These were okay, 37. So this is, this is, I mean, this is super interesting. You're saying then blood glucose, which is another way we describe blood sugar, you're saying that in the, the data that you have seen and what you have been tracking, and you meticulously track, I've got to say, you meticulously track your own data on yourself. You're <laughs> always tracking your heart rate variability yeah. and matching what you do in your life and how that reflects things and you're altering it, which is why you look the picture of health in front of me <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, so you, you, you take this very seriously, both as a guinea pig yourself, um, but, but also with, with some of your clients. And that's really fascinating that you're saying that the blood sugar level is not necessarily correlating with how many carbs they've been eating. In health individual, that, it, that was my findings out of 37 individuals monitored for four to six weeks. Some people would have four, some other people. We started from 52, but unfortunately, it, mm, I had to eliminate certain data because it was just not precise enough. Um, so they had blood glucose in one day or HIV in the other day, and I couldn't mind that. Yeah. And that, that's very, it's important. You know, this is a small data set relative to a big trial, but it's something you meticulously do. You take very seriously. You want to be able to find out more so you can help your clients get better. So what are Correct. those factors then? If it's not carbs that's correlated with blood sugar in healthy individuals, what is it? So to firstly answer your question on type 2 diabetes, I think uh, excess of carbs do play a role and is one of the things as mentioned that I would definitely would consider, but not then to rebound on other substrates. So it's not that they keep the carbs very low and then they, you know, splash out on fats and they, um, you know, have a very, very poor diet is not the only factor. So these are things that definitely we need to consider. Physical activity in type 2 diabetic is still the factor that has impacted the most alongside high life load people may call that stress, um, and sleep. It wasn't so much dietary based. I mean, this is, what, I mean, what you're saying is really, I think, really important because just to be clear, you know, from what you're saying, uh, and I've said this before, you know, I think that what is called a low-carb diet does have extreme clinical utility for some patients. Correct. Um, I... I you know, I'm not a huge fan of the term low carb um, because I think we're calling 
one macronutrient where you know we're, you know uh, a carb one carb can have a very different impact on the body than another carb correct you know, a um you know a highly processed you know cracker can have yeah. a very different impact from a sweet potato let's say absolutely and so but, uh, but what the sort of thing most people consider when they they think about a low carb diet is a diet low in I hope, refined and processed carbohydrates. And some people go quite aggressive on all carbohydrates, that's for sure. There's a big variation out there. Yeah. But I do think this is really interesting that it's not just that that is correlated with your blood sugar. Sleep is playing a big role. Yeah. Uh, physical activity is playing a big role. And stress yeah. is playing a big role. And you've seen that, I think, yourself, haven't you, when you're very stressed, that your blood sugar goes up. So if I'm if I'm doing like a lecture tour or what we call a roadshow or whatever, um, after the third day, my HIV drops fine. Um, so just to, just to make sure we're clear on that, your HIV is getting lower, which means correct. there is more stress on the body. The body is in more time sympathetically activated. Yeah. Um, both I measure ongoing measurements, but also snapshot in the morning. In snapshot in the morning, it takes sixty seconds to 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 measure, and you can see. It, it, it. You normally you can see an increase in the first day, which is what we call rebound. Uh, but then following that, if you keep traveling, lecturing, and etc., you can see you can start to see a, a, a steady drop to a point. I was speaking to Jules the other day, and so how do professors in at university do they do this all day, seven days a week? How how do they manage? They need to be pretty fit. So I think there are variations on, because obviously I do this only at times. I don't do this all day long in an established environment where I go in, you know, yeah. do something. You're somewhere. tracking it just from time to time to see what's going on. Exactly. And that, that I think is, 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 is quite, is very relevant in, in, in everyday life because uh, people t tend to single out things. So it's the diet or it's the stress, it's that, which can be, but the combination of many factors is way more detrimental than the single yeah. one. And this really resonates with, with my approach, Alexander, as you well know, this is why I'm always trying to expand the conversation beyond diet or beyond physical activity. It's a combination of factors that result in your health. You may be excelling in one area, but you may be neglecting three other areas. And you just got to, we've got to start not looking for perfection, but looking for balance across all these areas, which is a big thing that I stand for. I, I think, I think you have said to me before, I'm pretty sure that actually when you're tracking your own data, you find that, um, is it putting your child to bed is when you are in one of the most stressed states yeah. of the day? Absolutely. It was, it was me. And I was measuring. <laughs> because I know some parents listen to this and this is incredible. I think lots of them will yes. actually think, hold on a minute. I want to know more. What is going on there? So um, there was uh, uh, some time ago and I was, I was, I was, um, so I have this report um, and I was taking ongoing measurements. So it's not only that I can see the baseline, but I can also see what has affected directly at that moment in time, my heart availability. So it could be a, a, an unpleasant call or it could be something that has happened or I don't know, what have you. And I could see that it was actually pretty great. And I thought, what is that? And I've noticed that for four, five days in a row, I could see this massive spike. And at least this little program actually said to me, this were your first, um, this is, these were the highest, most stressful um, 15 minutes of your day. So the most stressful 15 minutes of your day has been reflected with a low HRV reading. That is correct. And you were thinking, well, what, what's going on there? Yeah. And you have the possibility to put a diary online. And I thought, family time. I put family time. So, And then I started to see the exact time. And it was my son's bedtime. He is renownedly so, one of the probably latest chronotype children I have ever come across. And it doesn't matter what you do, he just does it. He does all of them. He stalls, he doesn't want to say he's scared at the time, not now. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, psychologists and counselors will not sue me for this, for saying this. I went up to him and I said, dude, see this? See this graph? Yeah, you are the biggest stressor 
in my life. <laughs> I said that in a jokey manner, sure. etc. Milo, we can't we can't have these arguments day in day out for exactly the same thing. So we need to find a way. And there was some some unfortunate bartering. I detest doing that with 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 children. Um, but we have came to, and suddenly that was reflected straight away. It's not just the fact that it's the most stressful fifteen minute. Consider wrong and they. In this most stressful 15 minutes, you should be recovering, but it's going to take you a while to wind down from that. This is if you see that as a stressor. If the parents say, well, okay, whatever, then obviously it's a very different approach. Yeah, you're right. So that your reflections, you, you know, what you put onto that situation really determines whether your body perceives it as stressful. If you are really trying to get them onto bed on time because you know it's good for them and they need the routine. Yep. They might, well, they might be chilling out. They may not be, but we might be feeling stressed. I mean, I certainly know that feeling. Um, I, I, you know, I think one of the things that this is saying to me is that there's, there's huge benefit in understanding your body better, understanding what things in your life start to have an impact on your stress levels. And it will be different from diff for different people. So is this the sort of thing that people can do themselves? Absolutely. Absolutely. So they can start with something really, really, really cheap and cheerful with like an app that measure heart variability. They don't even need for certain apps to actually buy any uh, heart rate straps or they can just use the camera of a smartphone, for example. Um, and that's what I use. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I do it once a day in the morning. Yeah. And at the same time every day. And it, you know, it's also, you start to build up a picture. You go, you know, I'm not individualizing everything in a day, but I see, oh, you know, whenever I've been traveling, for example, yep. I see my heart rate variability the next morning is really low. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, but what are the other, what, I guess, what are the factors that you have seen? Are there some common things that people can hear, which they might be, they might be expecting, they might not be expecting, really have an impact on, in, in a, for want of a better term, stress on the body. So, for example, you mentioned earlier the, the time of eating. Uh, that was a big one for me because I thought as long as you can digest a bit before you retire, it should be okay. We did not cover chronobiology as far as eating is concerned at college. I think I don't know, even know if there were any studies about it. And there are now starting to emerge in, in humans, I think, um, but was, uh, um, what was interesting is that up to, so I, I had to transform the data into block of two hours. Okay. So I had to make a categorical data and what, what, what was interesting. So it was between two and four, four and six, six and eight, eight and 10 PM. And heart rate variability didn't seem to be affected until after eight o'clock. So when people ate after eight o'clock, do consider that there is a two hours chunk. So I'm not saying is eight or one has the same effect as as nine fifty nine or or, or um, oh, nine fifty nine. Sure. So it could go worse or better. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. But I could actually I could actually start to see a trend, and the heart availability doesn't seem to be affected. Blood glucose does. The later we eat, or this 37 uh, people cohort uh, ate, the higher is the fasting glucose the following day, especially if that is prolonged. So they do that continuously. So even if they're eating a healthy diet. Correct. A diet that might be low in refined and processed carbohydrates that one might think is optimal for their blood sugar, you're saying that by eating late... Yeah. the body still mounts a blood sugar response to that. That is correct. Um, in fact, in some people, has manifested as what is normally referred as dawn phenomena. So basically, they go to bed with a certain blood glucose and they wake up, which is much, much more higher blood glucose. And um, often, even on a healthy diet, especially for the breakfast skippers, then unfortunately we then have observed a rebound in the evening because they've been skipping breakfast, perhaps having stimulants during the morning to try to get some, you know, to try to get going. Um, they like have coffee? 
Yeah, absolutely. But, but you'd be surprised. Green tea and yerba mate, matcha, anything. whatever you, anything. Um, and then what was to me really, really interesting is that then the choices in the evening were not only different, but the quantity of the food that we're ingesting, it was, it was really, really heavy load on the digestive system. You know, I think this is really echoing what a lot of the time restricted eating research is, is suggesting that actually when we eat is arguably or potentially as important as what you eat. And that's it's really something that I don't think the message has got out there yet. I think people think as long as I'm having a healthy meal, yeah. it doesn't matter. And you know, that's a ta- brilliant point. That's an absolutely brilliant point because yeah. most nutritionists wouldn't no, I'm so sorry, I rephrase that. Um Many times I hear practitioners that don't seem to take in consideration the timing of it. Yeah, timing time is huge. And, you know, I was telling you two nights ago, I was in London. I, I was, you know, busy all day and there was an event on gut health that I was lecturing at in the evening. And I remember we ate after the event. Now, I normally eat pretty early. I try and eat with my children when I can yeah. and then stop, you know. Yeah. It's not always possible when you're back late or you're on the roads. Everyone at the event ate after the conference, uh, after after the events in the evening. Right. And uh, we probably had dinner at 10 p.m. Whoa. Which is, A, it's out of my normal routine. And we, we sort of intuitively know this. You know, I didn't sleep well at all. You know, I didn't have to get up early, but I just couldn't sleep very well all night. I was tossing and turning. Yep. And then all day, obviously, I was tired. I was yep. craving sweet foods. Yep. All day, you know, and I don't really eat that much sweet food. I'm, you know, I've got my diet pretty, pretty dialed in most of the time. But you just see how one thing can have such a knock on effect. And yeah. I, for people listening, I'd really encourage you to think about what time you have your evening meal. I think it's, I think it's a really simple way to impact multiple parameters in your health by, by bringing it forward. Do you think, in your experience, are you saying that an earlier dinner time is better? Absolutely. Without no shadow of a doubt, we leave out very specific um, demographics, for example, athletic performance and et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, uh, within reason, um, it would be wise to have an earlier type of dinner. So you mentioned that some people may take stimulants in the morning, whether it's you know, green tea, coffee, you know, all kinds of things that we take to get us going because we are living such, you know, busy, stressed out lifestyles that many of us need help to get going in the morning. Yeah. A lot of people drink a lot of caffeine. And I'm just wondering, have you seen anything in HRV in the the readings that you've done that correlates to caffeine? Oh, you you mentioned the caffeine. (laughs) It's been one of the things that's interested me so much. So um, everything started because I did an experiment with my HIV, I mean, my blood glucose. So I measured the typical um, hotel sachets that you find, uh, which I clearly don't drink. Um, But I thought, I'll give it a test because we were told not to have caffeine because caffeine is excitatory, is bad for us, is dehydrating and et cetera, et cetera. So I started to dig a little bit uh, more in the science. now, caffeine seems to be affected by many things. We are affected by caffeine due to many things. One of them is how we clear the caffeine, how sensitive we are to the caffeine. So uh, straight away, we have an individual reaction to the caffeine. However, I took myself and I thought, right, okay, let's see how I react with that. And another day, I took a very high quality caffeine um, coffee drink. I'm talking coffee, not necessarily caffeine alone. Okay. So my glucose within less than 10, 12 minutes shot above 6.2 millimolar, which is pretty high. For you? For me, with a freeze-dried hotel typical um, coffee sachet. Did that coffee sachet have sugar in? Did it have... No, 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 no. Just black. I okay, didn't want... so just a, a, a just black. an instant sort of black coffee yep. that you'd find in any hotel room. In um, any hotel room, usual that brands. That spikes your blood sugar. That had created that massive spike. I do not know 
if I cannot quantify the caffeine content of yeah. that, I cannot quantify so many things. But what I took as a as a as a um, as a guideline is one coffee. So we wanted to see the effect of different one coffees, if that makes okay, any so sense. Okay, so you had one of those, and then have you did you compare that with a high quality coffee as well? Then I did the same a few days later. Obviously, you don't want to add too much caffeine in the same yeah. go, um, and I tested with my normal coffee, which is high quality. I go to the roastery personally, I grind it myself, yada, yada, yada. So I did that and my glucose went from 4.5 to 4.6. So a minimal rise. Well, the change is below the error of the instrument I was using. So, so, so it could have been the same. Negligible. Could it could have been, been the same, could, could have been lower. Down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I started to study a little bit more on that, adding the heart rate variability. And if the... So the, what I'm trying to say here is that the quality of the coffee can have, can have a substantial impact on top of the amount of caffeine taken. So there are two things here. People may react to coffee or people may react to caffeine. People may react to both and people may react to neither. So when people have a coffee, to me, opens like 10 questions. Okay, what type of coffee? What, how was it made? Is it percolated or just a really simple, quick espresso normally showing less quantity of caffeine? My personal limit is. 120 milligrams of caffeine before 2 p.m. So you have been that precise. You have quantified for you if you do that and you yeah. don't go above that. Correct. And you stick to that amount of good quality coffee before 2 p.m. Yeah. What, there is what, minimal effect on the rest of your physiology? The, the, the effect is not statistically significant at all. Wow. I cannot see any changes in... HIV, blood glucose, following day, the day following that. So over a period, this is wow. ongoing data. It's so tracking. impressive that you actually go through this that meticulously because then you, you really are able to personalize your lifestyle for your physiology. It's just incredible because you literally know <laughs> how things affect you. So can I ask you, what happens if you do go above 120 milligrams? That depends what is coming after that. So if I have more caffeine and then later on I'm training or doing very physical work, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have a very noticeable in effect, but I still see a slight variation. In what? In generally, for example, sleep onset is a big one. So it's um, harder to fall asleep. Yeah, or just later, perhaps I, I'm just not tired. Normally, I'm a bit I more wired, and you don't want to fall asleep. Yeah, yeah or, or even just feeling awake, and that is the problem. Because if you're feeling wired, then you think, right, I'm wired. This is not normal. I need to do something about it. But if you feel just awake and you feel good, then you're less likely to do something about it because you feel good. Yeah, about it. And you might think then also that you're a night owl. And this is something that I, um, I did write about in the stress solution, actually, the, the myth of the night owl. Now, night owls do exist, right? From what I can tell from looking at the research, there are some genetic um, differences. But in my experience, a lot of people put themselves down as being night owls when it's actually their lifestyle that is driving them to be a night owl. And when they alter their lifestyle, suddenly they can go to bed early, they can wake up early. And I'm talking about coffee and caffeine. Yeah. I'm talking about light exposure in the evening. All these things, I'm looking at your smartphone late into the evening, which it's... Uh, I mean, you're very impressive, actually. I've noticed if I ever text you past 7 p.m., I'd say, you rarely respond. I don't think you've ever responded until the morning. Correct. And I think that's quite interesting for people. Tell me what, what goes on there. So the, to me, the, the, the brain will have more power on my physiology. Um, call it whatever you want, class A type personality, or it doesn't matter what you call it. But if, I, if, I, if my brain gets stimulated, we call it hyperarousal, you then are able to offshift the natural 
calming, cooling, recovering, relaxing time that can potentially have an effect on your sleep. Not necessarily just the length, but also the quality or just even simply the onset. I always thought that I was a late night owl. Did you? I'm not. I just constantly crave for that time by myself, alone, being exposed to light in the evening, being exposed to things. I used to be more creative in the evening, so I kind of prolonged that and really, really struggled to then fall asleep for hours and hours and hours. And then that had to be compensated for the late start of the day. And what what was interesting is that um, what it seems to me, based on my research, it seems that Our modern society is exacerbating the chronotype thing. So if you are a night owl, you're also more likely to do more stuff in the evening. Now, that is not going to help the chronotype anyhow. It's not going to help anyone. So could it be that our modern lifestyle, our modern society, training late, eating late, getting um, engaged cognitively late, is exacerbating the difference between the chronotype. And we, we, I personally think that that plays a major part. If you go to a place, I'm, I'm reluctant to say holiday because then people on holiday do other stuff to be like chronotype. But if you go into a holiday that you can just live by the <coughs> natural rhythm, I, I have been very surprised on how many patients and colleagues have mentioned, well, I was actually waking up with the sunlight and then going to bed a lot earlier, despite I was on holiday, especially in camping holiday. In fact, one of the studies specific was measuring dim light melatonin onset in people that were sleep, not sure if it was sleep deprived or they were socially jet lag, Um, but they went out camping in, uh, I think it was around Denver, Colorado. And they just naturally picked up a, a very natural rhythm, and the difference between the chronotype was very, very small. If I if I recall correctly, hey, this is exactly what Professor Sachin Panda said to me yep. when I was, love his work. His work's brilliant. I've, he's been on the podcast before. Two of the most popular episodes I've had actually were, were with uh, Professor Panda, and I was lecturing with him last year in Iceland, and we went out for dinner in the evening. And I asked him that question, I said, hey, look, what happens? You know, this night owl thing really confuses me because a lot of my patients who say they're night owls, actually, once we start altering their lifestyle, getting them to wind down in the evening, switching off their technology, before you know it, then they're no longer night owls. Um, Again, me, I used to be up very late, creative time, everyone's asleep, put a light on, I've got quiet time. But you know what? I flipped completely where now... I, and to be fair, I've always been an early wiser, but I now fall asleep often at half nine. My, my rhythm now is about 9.30 to 5.30. Um, and, it, you know, I feel great. So I often get that quiet time first thing in the morning. It wasn't the fact that it was nighttime. It was just I was craving quiet time yep. when the rest of the world around me was asleep. And I can have that in the morning just as well as I can have in the evening. Yeah. Um, so I do think a lot of people sort of, tell themselves that they're night owls. And they might be, of course, but even if you are a night owl, you could be exacerbating that Correct. with, with our behaviors. Um, hey, Alessandro, look, I, I, there's so much more I want to ask you. And I know you're writing a book at the moment on all of this. So maybe once that's complete, I can get you back on. But Absolutely. It would be my utter pleasure. It's- what, what I'd love to finish on for people who have been fascinated by this, first of all, we were mentioning how you can track this yourself. I have got an app that you recommended to me, actually, that yeah. I just do once a day to give me an idea of what my base level of stress is per day. And it is really, I find it really, really useful. Can you just tell tell, tell people what those apps are in case they want to download them? Sure, sure, absolutely. I, I, I tend to use mainly two apps. Uh, one is more perhaps um, sport-related that you can use with a smartphone uh, camera. Uh, there is uh, HRV4 training, where four is the number four. So HRV4, the number training, or one word, uh, both on iTunes and, and um, Google Play. And the other one is Elite HRV. There are other apps. It just that happens to be that many, many years ago, I started to work with these. And I'm just 
more familiar. Uh, so there are other apps out there that you don't have sure. necessarily to use these. Um, I, I will link to all these guys in the show notes page of this podcast, which will be drchatterjee.com forward slash Alessandro. So if you go to that at the end of the podcast or now, you'll see all the links to everything we've talked about uh, in case you do want to download some of those apps. Um, but finally, you know, I like to finish off you know, the whole point of this podcast really is to inspire people to be the architects of their own health, you know, to empower them with tips that they can apply immediately. So you have done a lot of complex testing on yourself, on your clients. Not everyone who's listening to this is going to A, know how to do it, be motivated to do it. So are there sort of, I don't know, are there four kind of big take-home tips for people that you can think of based upon your data, based upon your work, based upon your clinical experience that you can give them and potential ones that they're not already thinking about? Wow, uh, what a question. Um, yeah, I the first one that I keep always in my head, go back to the basics. Check the basics. Check if you have addressed truly the basics rather than go into uh, very advanced type of classes and, I don't know, whatever, CrossFit or something weird, just move. Get, get some physical activity, whatever that may be. Um, eat cleanly in what makes you feel good. Um, these are all really simple things. Follow, try really to follow as much as you possibly can. Just natural cycles. Um, this is how body has evolved. And seemingly now research is coming out to see that is how it actually feels the best. Um, the two people I quote the most in, 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 in the book I'm writing are my grandparents, despite the 250 papers that I'm arguing, quoting, referencing, uh, and so on. So that's the first thing. Second thing, I would say, listen to your body you know more about yourself than anyone on the planet. Allow for recovery. You push your body is one of the most metabolically intelligent thing we are ever going to have to our uh, disposal. And it, it just make sure that if you're pushing through, you have to allow for recovery. That's the reason why some of the best tools for athletic performance now are focusing on sleep, on chronobiology, or things that are... In, they are in build in and, and performance, performance enhancing performance enhancing if you do that right absolutely you said something really interesting because we're what time is it it's about I don't know maybe 6.30pm in the evening we're recording yeah. this in December at the moment yeah. and you have got to drive home tonight yeah. um, which is probably going to be two or three hours I imagine in the car correct so you know that this is a big stress on your body and so you are taking compensatory action tomorrow I believe correct I cancel pretty much everything. So if I'm going to feel good, I may train. Um, I'm, I'm teaching class in on, on a karate class on Sunday, and, and I have to be on form because that's demanding clearly. Um, so you're going to rest tomorrow. You're going to say, hey, look, it's been a stressful week. See how I feel. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And which is a great lesson for people. Sometimes the best thing to do is say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do nothing today, and I'm just yep. going to chill out, relax, read a book. Yeah, um, the doing nothing thing, um, it would stress me out. So yeah. I would do something that you know is soothing for you. If it is, I don't know, watching your favorite series, so as long as it's truly relaxing to you. To, I keep reminding people, the, the kind of gentleman that was washing the car and being parasympathetic, I don't know, wash the car of the whole village, I, what have you. It doesn't matter. That's his thing. So we That's need his to, thing. We, we need to find our thing. Beautiful. And whatever that is, you're going to do your thing tomorrow to relax. And I think we Absolutely. all kind of know what our thing is, or many of us do anyway. Yeah. I would just don't feel we've got time to engage in it. Correct. Um, so that's a really nice message for people that they must prioritize recovery. Find, find what, you know, what brings recovery. Um, please consider social interaction. So, of course, I'm a nutritionist. I'm trying not to be biased and mention eat a clean diet, of course. But um social well-being is dramatically important uh what do you mean by that exactly just make sure that you 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 spend time with people you love um if you don't have in any find <laughs> one um yeah, just yeah, on that I, I mean it's really important to say that if you don't feel you have people close to you 
um, whether it's friends or family, you know, a simple way of trying to um, build up those connections. It might be to join a local sports club or a local hobby. Absolutely. Something, something you're interested in because you're likely to find similar people to you at that event it might be hard at first you might feel nervous and shy yeah is exactly as you say so join a sport club with people that are like you or similar to you or yeah. very different from you it doesn't really but matter you share a common interest you and... share a common interest and yeah. and and sometimes you should be feeling like you can pick up a conversation exactly where you left it even after two yeah. three four five weeks you haven't spoken to someone I mean, these are lovely tips and particularly, I think, coming from a, a nutritionist, you know, it's, it's, it is remarkable that the four tips that you gave were actually not really related to nutrition. Yeah. I mean, there's just great tips for people uh, that, you know, yes, you can do all the data that you've done, uh, but you can also try and listen to your body a bit more and see, you know, you'll probably get some of the way there just by doing that. Alessandro, thank you for your time today. Appreciate you coming up to see me and actually uh, us able to have this podcast that we have been trying to have for a few months now. I think that's really interesting for people and I hope to have you back on soon. Um, Rongen is in my absolute pleasure. Um, yours this year is probably the book I recommended the most because uh -huh. people are missing the basics. And they embark on all sort of fads things and, and things that are way too extreme. So they go the mile deep, meter wide kind of approach. Whereas what you are doing for this nation and what you're doing in general, uh, have people listening to you from Australia, for example. Um, and, and what you're doing is, I think, consolidating, crystallizing the message to listen to the basics. And that is absolutely awesome. So... You can have me anytime you, you, you want. It's been definitely a pleasure for me. Alessandro, thank you, and we'll see you soon. You're welcome. Thank you. That concludes this week's episode of the Feel Better, Live More podcast. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation and that you feel inspired to take on board some of Alessandro's top tips there at the end. I think for me, one of the standout tips is about allowing yourself recovery. This is such a simple concept, yet one that we often don't think about enough in our day-to-day -day lives. That if we have exerted ourselves, we need to allow some time to recover. I'm sure that some of you will feel like tracking your own HRV after hearing our conversation. And I hope you find the apps that we mentioned in the conversation useful. You can see links to all of those apps in the show notes page for this episode, which is drchatterjee.com forward slash Alessandro. As well as those links, I have put a few online articles there that I think you will find interesting so that you can continue your learning experience now that the podcast is over. There's also a link there to Alessandro's own website and all of my books. Now, for those of you who are interested in learning more about HRV, I summarize the key take-home points in a very accessible way in my most recent book, The Stress Solution. I walk you through what HRV is, why it is relevant, and then most importantly, give plenty of tips on how you can improve your own HRV score, which basically helps you to minimize the impact of stress on your own body, which in turn will allow you to thrive. I've also outlined some of my top tips for shift workers in the book to really try and help minimize the impact that shift work has on one's health. If this is something that interests you, you can pick up a copy of The Stress Solution in all the usual places, either as a paperback, an ebook, or as an audiobook, which I am narrating. As always, please do let Alessandro and I watch you thoughts of today's show on social media. And if you do enjoy my weekly podcast, one of the best ways that you can support them is by leaving a review on whichever platform you listen to podcasts on. You can also help me spread the word by taking a screenshot right now and sharing with your friends and family on your social media channels. Or you can simply tell your friends about the show. I really do very much appreciate your support. Just a quick reminder, if you do enjoy the podcast and can spare 10 seconds, please do consider voting for my podcast in the British Podcast Awards. You can do this by going to britishpodcastawards.com forward slash vote and typing in feel better, live more. It literally takes under 10 seconds to do. So if you can spare the time, I genuinely do appreciate it. A big thank you to Richard Hughes for editing the podcast and to Ali Ferguson and Liam Saunders for the theme tune. That is it for today. I hope you have a fabulous week. 
make sure that you have pressed subscribe and I'll be back in one week's time with my latest episode. Remember, you are the architects of your own health. Making lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you live more. I'll see you next time.